Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Brandon Laws. I'll be your moderator for today. Today's webinar is better together working with employees to improve performance. And we have a special guest host, Lacey Partipillo. She is a senior HRBP at Zenium. And uh, before we get an intro for her, I'm going to do a little housekeeping. So I wanted to let you know we have about 20 to 30 minutes of presentation uh, queued up for you today. Uh, so Lacey will go through the core content of her presentation, and then we'll do uh, whatever time we have remaining for Q&A. And we'll definitely get you out of here by 1045. Um, I know how people like webinars really short and sweet. Take away a couple of nice nuggets and then get on with the day. So uh, we'll make sure to get you out of here by that time. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, I'll be monitoring questions uh, throughout the session. So please go ahead and open up the, the GoToWebinar panel and there's the, the box for the chat and just enter any questions that you have and uh, I'll either address those in the moment if I can or during the Q&A session, we'll, uh, we'll talk about it live. And a lot of people do ask, slides and recording, are they available? Absolutely. So if you have to jump out, Totally understand that. We'll definitely get you the slides and the recording. You may notice on the panel uh, for GoToWebinar, we are recording at the, at the moment. So we'll have the whole video, slides, audio, all that for you. And we'll follow up in an email about 24 to 48 hours afterwards. And if you want more of our content, find out what we're up to from, from an event standpoint, our podcasts, our content, go to our website, scroll about halfway down on the homepage. And there you'll see an, a place where you can enter your email address and name, and you can subscribe that way. The other way people like to, to follow us is we have a podcast, uh, weekly episodes for that. If you have an iPhone or Stitcher app or something like that, you could usually just go there, type in uh, human resources for small business, or you could type in Zenium HR, and you'll find that and you can subscribe that way. So that's a good way to stay in tune to our content um, on a regular basis. Okay, so I'm going to introduce Lacey and then I'll, I'll turn it over to her. So Lacey Partipilla, she's a senior human resources business partner at Zenium. She supports many of our clients who are in the small to mid-size range. She's got a, a giant book of clients uh, and, and we're very lucky to have her. She's been at Zenium and the Stoller Group of Companies for a lot of her career and, and it's been a pleasure to have her. If you want to hear more of Lacey, she is regularly on um, speaking at a lot of our workshops here at Zenium. So if you if you want to know more about those, we'll, we'll follow up in a, in a link, but you're also welcome to go to our website uh, to the events tab and you could a lot of times just scroll through and see when she's speaking and, and people love love her speaking. So um, definitely check that out. And then I also have her jo join her on a lot of our podcasts. So she's probably been on about 20 of the 130 episodes or so that we have. And Lacey's awesome. So go check out that as well. And of course, Lacey writes for us all the time too. So anyways, uh, Lacey, I'm going to turn it over to you now. And we're going to talk Thanks, about performance yeah. improvement. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with everyone and talk about this really important topic. Good managers and leaders that we work with here at Zenium and really everywhere understand that the most valuable asset in your company is your employees. And when we're thoughtful and mindful of that, we're able to build strategies around retaining talent and um, able to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the businesses um, out there. So today we're going to talk about one of the key elements in retaining people and building teams, and that's um, managing performance and some tools and takeaways for you hopefully today on how to do that. So we'll discuss why it's so important. I have some interesting statistics that I'm excited to share with you. We're also going to talk about the difference between uh, the more old school way of thinking when it comes to performance management and a newer way to consider managing the performance of your employees. We'll go through the elements of a performance improvement plan, what to do when an employee isn't meeting those expectations for your organization. And then how do we measure success and what to do beyond that? So why should we manage performance in the first place? Why is it important to employees? Why should it be important to your organization? 
Those are questions that many managers and supervisors ask us when they start working with us. Managing performance is so important to the health and success of your organization. And when employees' behaviors and characteristics are aligned with your organization's mission and value system, synergy is created. Behaviors that are consistent with values help employees feel connected to the work that you're doing, to your purpose, and when there's connection at that level, we actually see that productivity increases and we're able to retain the employees whose values are aligned. It also helps align their individual contributions with business objectives. So if I'm an employee in your organization, I need to know how my performance impacts the greater good of the company. How do the tasks that I'm completing every day tie back to that bigger picture? Managing performance and providing feedback to employees helps align those contributions to those business objectives and really just further supports better execution of business strategies. And it also helps increase employee engagement and retention. So when we're thinking about talent planning and development and how we keep those great employees engaged, research and statistics really show that feedback and performance management is directly tied to engagement. There was actually a recent Gallup study that um, talked about um, managers giving feedback to employees, and they looked at a thousand employees over all different industries. Um, what they noted was that managers who failed to provide feedback to employees or actively manage performance, so having those daily discussions with folks about what's going well, what's maybe not going so well, those managers failed to engage 98% of their workers. So those workers that were surveyed in this study rated very, very low levels of engagement when their managers weren't giving them feedback. So we know that by proactively managing performance, we can really improve the performance and the outcomes, not only for your employees, but for your organization. Let's take a look at the evolution of performance management. You'll see some differences here in the more traditional approach and then the newer approach that we're seeing and hearing about being more widely accepted in the business marketplace. You'll see some differences in these characteristics. Um, sometimes the traditional approach might be referred to as corrective action, where there's a problem and then we're addressing that problem or correcting it to make some improvement. This tends to be more reactive um, and the newer approach that we're seeing happening more often is companies are looking to shake things up and address the needs of their current workforce. There's data out there that says that 50% of the workforce right now is millennials. And what they're looking for is future focused feedback, something that will help those employees develop and grow within the organization. And so there are a lot of companies that are experimenting with performance management practices um, that will drive leadership behaviors. So companies like Accenture, Microsoft, Adobe, Google, Gap, these, these larger organizations, and a lot of small businesses that we're working with today, they're doing away with the annual reviews or rating and ranking of employees. Zappos is a company um, that is really known for their um, employee engagement. They've actually expanded upon this new thinking approach, and they have replaced the traditional process with one that's more based on continual feedback and self-improvement. So employees are actually engaged and excited about this process. It's more focused on reinforcing the development of more effective behavior, so building on the skills that employees may already have and those strengths that they possess. So rather than being rated and given feedback on how they're demonstrating um, skills and tasks, Zappos is actually kind of flipping that around and looking at how are employees demonstrating the behaviors that are associated with our core values, um, like delivering customer service? So to drive feedback, what Zappos asks of their managers, and this is, this is new and, and may blow your mind, but it's to provide employees with very frequent status reports on their performance. And it's only meant to be informational. So talking to employees about how much time they spend um, talking with customers or completing certain tasks, and then tying that back to bigger picture things and goals for the organizations. So 
So the managers aren't rating employees' performance on a scale, but talking more about how frequently they're seeing employees build upon skills and perform tasks that are high value items. When we ask managers to focus on performance, we consistently hear how important it is for managers to be able to articulate to their employees what successful performance looks like. And in another Gallup poll that they actually surveyed over 1 million employees and about 80,000 managers, they found that knowing what is expected had a great impact, impact on employee satisfaction and effectiveness. So outlining clear expectations from the get-go, and that starts in the hiring process when employees are onboarded into an organization, when performance expectations are clear, when they're documented and they're consistently communicated, we're able to deliver results. We can increase job performance and we can actually retain our key staff. And the highest performing managers are ones that help employees to set goals, prioritize projects, so that employees know the, the goal and where they're at in, in terms of that. Let's talk about what makes up performance. To keep it really simple, performance, I think, can be broken down into two things, the what and the how. So the what is the performance objectives or the performance goals. So when we, when we talk about goals, think about it like this. Goals tend to be good for jobs that are really dynamic, ones where there's near-term activities and milestones that can be defined. I think about an HR manager, for example. Performance or position objectives are ones that are good for jobs with really clear, very easily measured outcomes. So for example, an outside sales rep who has a quota that they have to meet, or a production employee who has a certain number of products that they have to produce during one of their shifts. And then there's also the duties that are associated with a job description, right? The job duties that employees have to perform that are most essential um, to the function of that position. And that should be clearly defined even before we start onboarding employees. Most managers and supervisors can clearly articulate the what. What I would encourage you all to think about is how do we frame up how employees do their work when we're talking about performance? So the how is behaviors and competencies. And what I mean by that is asking questions like, how is the job successfully performed? And we're defining behaviors that are associated with values and our organizational culture. So let's take the example of a receptionist. A performance objective for a receptionist might be to answer the telephone when it rings within three rings. So that's something that's easily measured. It's a frequent task that occurs for a receptionist. And it's a pretty essential part of that person's job duties. Now, if we look at the how that's done, we might suggest that the receptionist answer the phone within three rings using a courteous and professional tone. We may suggest that the receptionist smile when they're answering the phone or demonstrate a supportive team environment to the customers that are calling in. So that's a, sort of a different way to frame up performance rather than just focusing on the what or considering the how. And it's important to keep in mind that most work situations evolve and they change over time and some pretty significantly. So effective performance management behavior requires that managers are setting ongoing expectations, short-term goals that employees know about, that they can articulate, that they understand why these objectives are in place as situations change. I think we can all agree that this topic is really important. And what we hear from the clients that we're working with and all the data out there talks about this talent crisis that, that we're in. And it is real. We, many of us have open jobs with no talent to fill those. We may have inexperienced workers that are straight out of school that aren't ready for heightened responsibilities or a leadership position, for example. And then we have employees that might be looking to retire in the near future. Performance management is a very important tool in this kind of talent environment. 
But what do you do if you've got an employee that's just not meeting expectations? How can you provide a framework as a leader in your department to ensure that they're successful? One way that managers and supervisors are able to move performance and, and make things more positive for outcomes for employees and the organization is to utilize a performance improvement plan. And once we've identified a performance issue and we're looking for ways to improve the performance of an employee, this is a great way to get that framework started. The performance improvement plan or a PIP, it plays a pretty fundamental role in correcting performance discrepancies. Different than when an employee violates a policy or um, you know, isn't necessarily showing up to work on time, for example, we may be disciplining that employee in other forms. When we talk about a performance improvement plan, we're talking about using this as a tool to monitor and measure either deficient work products, so the quality of their work may not be meeting expectations, processes that might not be followed, behaviors of a particular employee that aren't in line with the organization's values or what we would expect of someone in that role. That's the key here is if we're looking to improve and modify behavior, we have to put in as much effort as employees are. So this is, this is the point where managers are really stepping up to the plate too to wrap around that employee to provide them structures of support to be successful. So how do we create one? Well, we first start by defining the problem. This is what I would call a deficiency statement. So we would determine if the problem is a performance problem. Maybe the employee hasn't been able to demonstrate mastery of, of a skill or a task. Or is it a behavior problem? That's the how, right? Employees may be able to perform the task, but maybe the way they do it, it creates an uncomfortable work environment or they're disruptive in the workplace. So the questions that you can ask are, what are the aspects of performance that are actually required to successfully perform these duties? What skills need improvement? What behaviors need to be modified? After we've defined the problem, we have to establish the priorities of these duties and behaviors. What's most important? And what are the consequences of errors associated with these duties? We might be talking with the employee and discussing how frequently these duties are performed, how do they relate in comparison to other duties and the priority of those, and what is the impact of the deficiencies. This is so important for managers to be able to help employees see the impact of their behavior and of their work products. After we've done that, we have to identify standards for performance and how we'll measure those performance indicators. Are we being reasonable? Are the standards that we're asking employees to live up to attainable? By establishing some short-term and, and long-term goals and a time frame for those, we're able to work with the employee to accomplish this change. And lastly, we create the action plan. And I would tell you to create it with the employee. So it's a co-creation, if you will. And what's the manager going to do to help the employee accomplish these goals within the desired time frame? We might ask, will the employee be doing anything additional to facilitate improvement? For example, are we going to ask the employee to take some courses or read a leadership book if they're not demonstrating leadership qualities? Those might be questions that we would be asking. We'd ask if the items can be accomplished. Is there any flexibility? And establishing periodic review dates. So important to stay on top of this. We want the employee to be in the know about where they're at when it comes to their performance, when we put them on some type of structured performance improvement plan. And is the employee and the manager both aware of what we're gonna be talking about in those check-ins? And then what might be those consequences if the employee isn't able to shift their performance in a positive direction? Remember, the goal is to clearly outline what's wrong, what's the impact, and what is needed on a go forward. And then together with your employee, you're able to measure actual performance against these standards to determine if the expectations were either not met, met, or in some cases, even exceeded. Setting the short and long range goals is important in the performance improvement process. And we know that 
SMART goals have been around for a long time, but they are a must when we outline performance gaps and future expectations. A goal needs to be specific and measurable. It really should answer all of those W questions, the who, what, when, where, why, and also how of the expectations of the goal. We wanna know how employees are supposed to meet that goal. When we're specific and we indicate things that are actually measurable, we're able to provide a reference point to help us sort of gauge our progress along the path. When we have really vague goals, things like do better with customer service, for example, those are ambiguous and usually they've got little effect on motivation. When we can remove the ambiguity and get real specific, it allows an employee to focus on really precise actions and behaviors related to the goal achievement. I would say the more specific the expectation, the more explicitly performance will be affected, either positively or maybe negatively. Specific performance metrics really lead to higher task performance by employees than those vague or abstract goals. So when you're working with your employees on these performance plans and we're indicating a goal or an outcome that we'd like to achieve, provide employees with this tool sheet on SMART goals to help them work through exactly what it is that we're asking them to come up with. Again, it should be something that's created together to increase buy-in and the employee's participation and engagement in the process. We all work in an interpersonal environment and feedback is communication about a person's performance. That's part of this process, right? And when we talk about giving feedback, we wanna be able to relate to an employee how their efforts are contributing to reaching the goals that we've set for them. And feedback's not meant to be criticism. Usually criticism has a value associated with it. Feedback should be descriptive. That's sort of the difference there. And effective feedback is where we're using references to goals. We're talking about tangible, actionable items, things that are timely. Feedback should be ongoing and consistent. And as a leader, giving feedback is a task that you perform again and again, really to let people know where they are and where to go next in terms of their individual, the team goals, and then also the organization's goals. Giving feedback is a touchy thing though. If you think back over feedback that you've received in the past, the chances are that you've probably been given feedback that helped you develop. And maybe there's some chances where in your career you've been given feedback that made you feel defensive, resistant, or sometimes it's even unmotivating. When you can put yourself back in your old shoes and think about the supervisors and leaders that you've worked with that have given you feedback, we're able to better improve our own feedback skills. This model that I have here for you, the desk model, is a helpful tool for managers and supervisors to frame the feedback in a way that's meaningful and supportive, and it actually can move performance. Let's talk about the framework. D is for describe. So we start by describing the employee's behavior objectively, that's a key part there, using really specific and behavioral terms and examples of what's going on. Giving an objective and a concrete description of what you've observed using I statements takes that criticism or personal attack feeling out of the question. E is for explain. We need to explain the impact of their behavior on themselves, on their team, maybe on your customers, the organization. I've gone as far as even talking about the impact that an employee's behavior might have on the community. And when you can explain the effect or the impact that behavior by an employee has had on your business, you can connect the employee to the why. And maybe the effect that the employee's behavior is created some type of emotion for you or for a customer. You should name that emotion. Your body language and your tone of voice when you're talking with the employee, it's probably already gonna be showing either being excited about something if we're giving positive feedback or frustrated. So putting that out in the open can help you move forward with that employee. S is for specify. Specify those behaviors that you want to see either continued, stopped, or started. And work with the employee too in a dialogue here to build a solution through either 
a directive, something like what I'd like you to do next time is, or something that's a little bit more collaborative, which I, I love this approach, where you can talk with the employee and ask questions like, what do you think we can do to avoid this next time? By gaining the employee's buy-in, it's so important, and this collaborative approach is a way to co-create this agreement. And that's the next step, is creating the agreement with input from the employee so that we can really maximize the strengths that they have or improve some type of deficient performance. By building this contract with the employee, we're able to gain their promise to work on the items that we've outlined. Another key part of the, the ending of this model is to check for understanding of what's been agreed upon. How many times have we left a conversation with an employee thinking they knew exactly what it was that we wanted them to be focused on and two weeks go by and there's no improvement. And we never checked for understanding because the employee didn't have a clear picture about the specific expectations that we had. So getting commitment for the future, asking employees, are there any barriers that may stand in your way to successfully meeting this expectation? I tell managers all the time, get all that stuff out on the table so that there's no excuse later. Remove the barriers, remove the objections so that we can move forward together. I know that giving feedback isn't easy for most of us, but when we can use a tool like the desk model and prepare in advance for the difficult conversations, we really are able to engage in real leadership behaviors that will move performance and encourage your employees' engagement and participation. The management of performance is critical to organizational success. I think we all agree that. If performance isn't managed and there's no standards and individuals and teams and organizations can sort of do what they want to do, people don't perform to their highest capabilities. And performance management through feedback and coaching and setting expectations and creating goals and plans, it shows employees that their performance and their achievements are recognized by you, their supervisor. It actually allows people to take on greater responsibility for personal advancement and growth. And the bottom line is that performance feedback improves the organization as a whole. So as a manager, you should be providing informal feedback and check the progress towards those goals regularly. Document and communicate expectations through corrective action, through performance improvement plans, by setting goals, and then adjust as needed as your organization changes. Work with employees to create a plan for improvement if they're falling short. Co-create that with them. Take the time to clearly outline what's needed for success and make sure you follow up. Holding them accountable and hold yourself accountable by continuing to provide feedback. And finally, and most importantly, make time to develop and coach your people. If you have an interest in retaining your top talent, this is a must, and I believe it really is at the heart of leadership. I'll go ahead and throw it back to you now, Brandon. All right, thanks, Lacey, so much. I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna put you on the spot, okay? Uh, let's let's do a little role play. Um, okay. You're my manager. Let's let's pretend that. Okay. <laughs> and um, using this desk model, let's say I've been having time and attendance issues, so I've been showing up late. So maybe mm -hmm. I'm I'm taking time off that wasn't pre-planned uh, and just you just notice something's wrong. So using that desk model that you just described for us, let's use that. Um, how do you provide feedback and describe what's going on with me to, to try to help my performance? Sure, so we'd start by describing your behavior objectively. So I like to use I statements. So I would say something like, hey Brandon, you know, I've noticed that it seems like every Tuesday and Wednesday, I'm noticing that you're not coming in until about 30 minutes after your start time. I'd like to have a conversation with you about that. So in that example, I've specified exactly the time frame that's missing, the days that it's happening. It's my own observation. Oftentimes that leaves things to be, you know, folks to be less defensive about those. So I think that's kind of the way that you would tee up what's happening. Then you'd describe the impact. So I would probably say something like, you know, when, when you show up late to work on those two days, it has a pretty big impact on the team. So 
X person over here has to cover for you and the phones are ringing and the customer you know, issues get backlogged. And so that impacts our reputation with our customers. And you know, I wanna have a conversation about what, it, what I'd like to see going forward. So specifying for you that I need you to show up to work on time and your start time is 8 a.m. And if you're gonna be late for an emergency, here's the call out procedure. Here's the protocol that you need to follow because just not showing up and moseying in, you know, when you feel like it, it's hurting your own reputation with your peers who are having to cover for you. So you need to be on time, eight o'clock every day, and follow the protocol if there is an emergency on a one-off basis. Let's talk about what's going on, you know, and have that discussion when we're creating the agreement to make sure that, you know, there could be something going on for you or an employee when you're talking with them about performance that's getting in the way. And we need to assume good intentions of our people and have that dialogue. So I'd ask, what's going on? You know, why, why is it that just these two days, it seems like, and you've been on time for most of your career, something, you know, recently happened. And maybe we find out there's a childcare issue or a car issue, whatever the case may be. Let's talk about that. Remove the barriers and, and get an agreement from you. You know, I need your commitment today, Brandon to show up to work on time and follow our protocol if you're going to be late. When you're when you're doing the the desk model when you're actually having that conversation is it is that what it is at this point is it a conversation is there is there any documentation that goes along with that or at this point in the game what's your take? I think you know having the conversation first tends to lead to a less reactive yeah. um, emotion from the employee. So I'm, you know, a fan of meet with the employee, have a discussion, learn what's going on because that can help inform how we provide, like I said, structures of support around that employee to help them improve things. So get the facts, get their take on it, listen, you know, be be there, be supportive, care about your people. And I think by having the conversation first, you're, you're able to do that. The desk model can be used though to frame follow-up emails that are sent to employees. It can be used to get yourself organized before you have the conversation in preparation. And then it can be used when you're drafting those performance improvement plans to make sure that we're getting in all of those pieces that are so important. Perfect. Thank you for letting me get my question in first. Uh, so I'd like to invite everybody. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to enter it in the chat window. I'll be, I'll be monitoring those as we're as we're still talking. Uh, but we do have a question from Jen. She asks, what is one of the biggest reasons somebody does not reach their SMART goal? So I imagine this must be in relation to like maybe a manager working with an employee on a SMART goal. What's the biggest reason an employee may not meet that SMART goal? Hmm. From your I can think perspective. Of, I can think of several. I think when, when SMART goals are um, ambiguous and not clearly defined, mm. so employees really don't have a clear sense of, of what they're supposed to be focused on. I think when they're not co-created, so when a manager writes the goal without any employee input, I think there's a high likelihood that that goal um, may not be met or not be met in a timely manner because we haven't been able to have that conversation about what is it that the employee needs, what resources are needed in order to meet it. Um, I also think SMART goals that aren't tied to where the employee is at in their own personal development, that can create issues. So having a SMART goal for, let's say, a department, and maybe an employee just isn't at a place where they feel like they can contribute to that, I think finding a way to tie in where folks are at in their own development is really important. So this next question comes from Alex. Um, you mentioned that we should manage performance that aligns with business objectives. And I think you mentioned this early on, if I remember right, Lace. Um, what's a good way to make sure that the business objectives are staying in front of an employee? That's a great question. So first, it's, it's incredibly important to make sure that the business objectives stay in front of an employee. Um, I need to know exactly where the company is going. Transparency is a huge part of employee engagement too. So where we're at in terms of um, how well the company is doing, for example. There are lots of different ways to do it. I think it depends on you know, how your organization is set up. Having you know monthly staff meetings where everybody has a chance to get together is a great way to do it. Breaking it down in department meetings too for managers to be able to articulate how that you know, individual department is 
impacting or contributing to that business objective. And then in conversations over and over, tying you know, the kudos and the accolades that we give to employees back to those business objectives. And same goes for the, the performance um, deficiencies that employees may have. Got a couple more questions coming in about the desk model, so we're gonna I'm gonna jump back to that. Uh, so during uh, during this conversation that we as managers may be having with an employee about um, just describing the desk model, should we like tell the employee that we're not gonna put it in writing up front, and can we mention that we will if if we have yeah, if we're gonna we, do so? Yeah, le leaving it open. So I I might say you know today is a, we're just having a conversation. So helping the employee to relax, I think that, that can be an effective way to do it. Today is just um, a discovery. You know, I wanna ask you some questions and um, really share with you what I've been noticing so that we can get to a place where we both feel good about moving forward. Um, and then, you know, making sure that the employee knows we may be following up on this. I may, we may be following up in, in writing on this and I really want to, let you know that it's so that we can hold each other accountable. I think making it in a way that is in support of the employee's growth, development, and performance versus punitive, where you know the employee did something wrong. Not to say that there's not a place for that in performance management in general, but I do think it's it's effective to tell the employee what's happening in that conversation and then leave the door open for follow-up. And you may go into it thinking, you know what, I'm ready to write this employee up, put them on a 30-day plan, and we're, we're gonna be exiting this person. By the end of the conversation, I've seen it more times than I can count where the manager has some aha moments, like, wow, they don't have the resources. Wow, let's look at what the training program has been. And we're able to sort of wrap around that employee and create a, a development plan that will help them move forward. All right, the next question comes from Kathy. She says, if I'm preparing for a difficult conversation and using the, the desk model, what should I do if I anticipate that the employee will react emotionally? Uh, that's a great question. I think being aware of what your employees' reactions tend to be is helpful. I think what you can do in a proactive way is when employees aren't at that elevated state, so maybe in just your regular check-ins, sharing with the employee that you notice that when there is a difficult conversation or a feedback conversation, what you notice their behavior to look like and asking them what you can do in that moment to support them so that you can have a more productive conversation. Usually when you know tempers are high or emotions are high, it's the brain just doesn't work in a way that people can um, think cognitively and problem solve through that. So. When, when folks are frustrated, sometimes it's okay to pause and to ask the employee if they want to, you know, do we need to take a five minute break? But knowing that we're gonna come back to this conversation because it's important, because I care about you, um, and paying attention to things like our own body language and our own emotions, because we're human too and we have our own reactions. So awareness of that is really important. All right, next question comes from Chris. He asks, by the time we require a performance plan, the relationships are often damaged. Should or how can we bring in others like upper management, trusted colleague, HR, mediator, et cetera, to facilitate these conversations if it's needed? Sure, I think anytime we're having a, a conversation that's disciplinary in nature, it's best to have a third witness. So whether that's another person in a supervisory position, your HR person or a senior leader, that's critical. I think before we get to the point of the performance improvement plan, by having those regular check-ins, and I would say monthly, if you've got a full-time employee where we're building relationship and trust, being open and honest with the employee, um, I think that can help facilitate this performance improvement plan process to be a little less reactive um, and help preserve that relationship. I also think paying attention to who employees respond well to is important, but at the end of the day, you're the manager. Um, they report directly to you, so you are the one that needs to be able to, to have that tough conversation, but resourcing the appropriate people and, and resources for yourself um, can be really helpful. Thank you. All right, uh, next question comes from Andrea. She asks, 
I have an employee that is three years away from retirement and is really setting herself apart from the team, but we need her to impart the information she has before she leaves. How do I get her to get back into the team spirit so we can get that information out of her prior to her retirement? Yeah, that's, that's a tough spot that a mm-hmm. lot of companies are in right now. Yeah. Um, that legacy knowledge and how do we you know, get all of that out and, and on paper um, using the desk model. I mean, this is a great way to do that. So her behavior is not aligned with the needs of the company. So keeping herself separate, not engaging in team meetings, not, you know, mentoring employees that you've set her up to mentor, for example, and explaining the impact of that. My guess is if she's she's retiring, she's maybe worked for you for a long time, she's probably pretty committed and loyal and cares enough about the company. So maybe being able to tie it back to that or tie it back to your organizational values and how this behavior doesn't relate. I also have um, clients and, and companies that we work with that have created mentor programs. And so um, that might be something that you could look at doing where it's a little bit more formal and less kind of ad hoc. And if it's if it's structured, you may have better success of getting that information from this employee over to your people. Okay, we got time for one more question. So um, I apologize if we did not get to your question, but we'll, we'll try to follow up with you separately if we can. Okay, so last question comes from Lori. She asks, how do you like to document performance? Oh, it depends. It depends on the situation. I, you know, I think I would say my preference is for it to be collaborative with the employee, to be um, supportive, um, for me to be accountable and how I've participated in the situation getting there. Um, at the end of the day, it's just important to document. So you kind of have to figure out what, what fits and what fits for your culture, but you know, corrective actions, write-ups, performance improvement plans, development plans that are future focused on expanding skills, or even follow-up emails um, can be effective ways to ensure that we're making sure that our message um, is landing correctly and memorializing those performance conversations. Um, performance doesn't change because you're really good at writing a performance improvement plan. Performance changes because we have an effective conversation with the employee that, that moves performance forward. Excellent. Lacey, I'm going to have you move the slide forward one. I'm going to give away your contact information. Okay, so if you need to reach out to Lacey, ask her a question, whatever it may be, uh, just tell her how much you love the webinar today. Reach out to her at Lacey Partipillo at zenemhr.com, and there's her direct line if you need to get a hold of her. I'm sure <laughs> she loves me for, for giving that away. Um, we have a lot of free resources. If, if you haven't consumed her content before today's webinar, go to our blog. It's zenemhr.com forward slash blog. The podcast, you can each either get to, get to them a few different ways. Go to iTunes if you have like the Apple Podcast application. You can just search for ZenEMHR or Human Resources and we'll show up. We have about 130 episodes. That's all free content. Uh, they're about 30 to 30 minutes to 45 minutes each. And uh, I personally host those. Lacey's on several of them. And then if you want webinars like this, we have we try to have webinars live about once a month, once every two months, and we keep the recordings on our website. So the URL is right there on the screen, right here at the bottom, and you're welcome to, to download those and view those. And then of course, follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and you can get our content pretty fast that, that way. If you need to reach out to me, I'm Brandon Laws. I'm the Director of Marketing at Zenium. My email address is brandon.laws at zenemhr.com. I want to thank Lacey Power to Pillow for being part of this webinar and uh, for shedding some light on on this issue. Uh, so happy that you joined us for today, Lacey. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a great day, everybody.